Hello, everyone, and welcome to EAB University today. I hope you're all having a great day, ready to learn a lot, and uh, you're having something to eat for lunch, those of you in the Eastern time zone, as I speak. We thank you for participating in today's Emerald Ashbor University. I'm Robin Osborne from Michigan State University, one of the coordinators of this program, along with my colleagues, Adam Whitty from Purdue University and Amy Stone from The Ohio State University. We hope you'll be enlightened with the great information you'll be provided on today's webinar. Today we switch gears away from our EAB pest and we're going to focus on another threat to our woodlands, the ambrosia beetle. Professor Matt Ginzel, an entomologist from Purdue University, is presenting information on the use of semiochemicals to detect and monitor invasive ambrosia beetle in hardwood forests. I'll give you a little bit of information about Dr. Ginzel. He received a bachelor's degree in or organismal biology from Beloit College in Wisconsin, and then went on to earn a master's and PhD in entomology from the University of Illinois at Urbana-Champaign. After a postdoc at the University of Nevada, Reno, he moved on to a faculty position at Purdue, where he is now an associate professor. Dr. Ginzel's work aims to understand how chemical signals mediate the location of host plants, mating, and the allocation of resources among indigenous and invasive beetles affecting the hardwoods. You'll see the chat pod on the left of the screen. Feel free to type comments and questions there. We will make a note of them and Matt will be responding to those questions after his presentation to keep the flow of the webinar smooth. Please stay tuned to the end because we would like to get your feedback and we will be providing a link to a survey that we'd like you to participate in. As well, for those of you needing CEUs, your survey information is necessary for us to process those CEUs. And the first 10 people to participate will receive an EAB goodie bag. Even if you've received an EA good EAB goodie bag in the past, we appreciate your continued feedback on this webinar as well. This webinar is being recorded and it will be available for viewing later this week at www.emeraldashborer.info. You will also find recordings for all our previous EAB University webinars there. And we appreciate any feedback that you can give to us because we always want to know how to make these webinars better. Thank you for attending today. And with that, I'm going to bring up Matt's presentation and we will begin. Good morning or afternoon. Uh, can you hear me okay? Great. <laughs> so I'm excited today to take part in EABU, and I'm going to tell you a little bit about some of the research that has been ongoing in my lab here at Purdue on semiochemicals, or chemicals that mean things to other organisms that, uh, that mediate behaviors, and primarily the colonization behavior of bark and ambrosia beetles that are affecting our native hardwoods. I should also point out that here at Purdue, I'm a member of the Hardwood Tree Improvement Regeneration Center which is a collaborative effort between Purdue and U.S. Forest Service for the production of fine hardwoods. And so some of this work um, has, is in direct, uh, it serves the mission of the HTRC. So my research generally is on the chemical ecology of wood boring beetles. I do work on longhorn beetles, such as um, you, might, you might have heard of the Asian longhorn beetle, uh, host colonization of the peach bark beetle, which I'll be talking about today, um, improved monitoring of ambrosia beetles affecting hardwoods, uh, host location of the emerald ash borer and its natural enemies, and also the caramones of the walnut twig beetle, which is a vector of thousand cankers disease. So skeletine beetles are difficult to uh, detect in hardwood systems. They spend most of their lives beneath the bark, so the bark or into the into the sapwood or heartwood of the tree. Uh, ambrosia beetles, in particular, vector tree-killing fungi, as well as some bark beetles do the same. And so because of this, they have a very uh, short adult life, life stage where they're flying. 
And so pheromones can be an effective lure for detecting and monitoring and controlling them during that adult life stage. And because they're uh, beneath the bark of trees, they're often difficult to control um, via chemical methods like uh, sprayed insecticides. So forestry in Indiana is, um, is a, an important part of our state commodity. Since 1950, uh, Indiana's forest lands have increased by over a half a million acres. Um, the total live biomass of the forest is almost 228 million dry tons. And it's a part of our economy such that it supports uh, $9 billion of uh, economic activity each year in the four, four and a half million acres of forest. Um, in Indiana, and if you can see from the map, a lot of our forests are in the southern part of the state here, uh, south of I-70, and Lafayette, we're kind of here. So one of the hardwoods that is of great value to Indiana is black cherry. Um, Indiana grows very good white, uh, white oak and a very good form of walnut, black walnut. But our cherry grows in its good form, but it's attacked by a beetle or uh, by a, a suite of insects that cause a response called gamosis. And so this gamosis reduces the quality of that wood uh, by about 90%. So it can no longer be used for veneer, but rather uh, it has to be used for things like the interiors of furniture and, and parts like that. So it greatly devalues it. This gamosis or gum spotting in the wood is caused by a number of abiotic factors. There's some evidence that uh, fungal infection causes gamosis, but also insect damage uh, is a great contributor to gamosis. And a lot that gamosis is a defensive response on the part of the tree. Um, the trees, uh, when uh, once experiencing an insult, like a feeding by an adult beetle, um, it exudes a sticky resin. Uh, through resin ducts. This is common among the ro rosaceae. It's also very common in the prunus and stone fruits such as peach and apricot, apple and plum. There's some evidence that this gamosis response on the part of trees is influenced hormonally. It's under hormonal control like through ethylene and jasmonic acid, acid pathways. So there are a suite, as I mentioned, there are a suite of insects that cause gamosis. Uh, the Peach tree borers, these clear wing moths. Um, the uh, cherry cambium fly can cause gamosis. But by and large, gamosis in Indiana is caused by this little bark beetle called the peach bark beetle. And it causes about 90% of the gum spots that we see in trees. During heavy infestations, black cherry trees in Indiana can uh, be covered in gum. So this is a defensive response on the part of the tree. It's an, uh, an attempt uh, uh, to defend itself from, the, uh, from this insult. The tree per tries to pitch out the beetle. It's a response to the colonizing adult. So it's those adults that, are that are, uh, come to the tree and feed through the bark cause gamosis. It's not the, the developing larvae underneath the bark. Oftentimes the trees are uh, uh, effective or successful in, a, in aborting attacks by these, tree, uh, by these beetles. And only a few attacks are needed to cause a loss of value through gum spots. And you can see some of these spots here in this picture. These little flecks in the wood degrade them. And so uh, these beetles, they overwinter as adults in the, underneath the bark of the tree. The, the adults that emerge early in the spring um, and seek a host. The females initiate this, the colonization and uh, colonization occurs in these nuptial chambers seen here, um, or mating does, occurs in these nuptial chambers. And then the female starts to chew a brood gallery horizontal to the grain of the wood and then the larvae hatch and feed out from this gallery. So we wanted to see, uh, understand the host colonization behavior of this beetle and what semiochemicals or host compounds or pheromones that the beetle might be producing such that we could use it uh, to manage um, this bark beetle. So what we set, we set out an experiment in the field 
where, or in the lab rather, where we uh, first tested the response of the beetles, adult beetles, to um, a bolt of black cherry, uh, to a bolt that was infested with females. And in this, this uh, would, uh, if they were to respond to this, it would be evidence that the females are producing a chemical signal. And also to, the, to a bolt infested with males, and in the same way we could determine whether the males are producing this uh, pheromone or a chemical signal, and we used a blank, um, uh, just a uh, blank chamber as a control in this experiment. And so these were done in a lab in, a, in an olfactometer, which is essentially a tube um, by which we can pull air over the odor source, such as uh, the bolt of black cherry. These were small bolts, maybe uh, four or five inches long and one or two inches in diameter. And the air is b drawn over that odor source and into the tube, and so we can measure the behavioral response of the beetles within that tube. And what we found was that males responded to a female infested cherry bolt uh, much greater than it did to either the cherry bolt alone, the male infested cherry bolt, or the control. So this was evidence to us from the lab that um, the females are producing a chemical signal that's attractive to males. So from that we decided to confirm this lab experiment in the field. And so we set up an experiment using uh, Lindgren, funnel, um, Lindgren multi funnel traps, you can see here. And these traps were baited with odor sources. Um, they were set out at Martell Forest, which is a Purdue owned uh, uh, forest and plantation on your campus. And we set out odor sources of a blank, which was just an empty mesh bag, or we hung from these traps a cherry bolt a female infested cherry bolt, a male infested cherry bolt, and a bolt that was infested with both males and females to see if we got if there was any additive effect um, from having uh, the uh, males and females together. So whether they were influencing each other in any way. And what we see from a result of this experiment was again that the female infested bolt was attractive. What was interesting is that in the field that both males and females responded to this uh, to this signal. So it appears as if, in this case of the peach bark beetle, that females are producing an aggregation pheromone, or um, uh, that is that is attractive to both males and females. Interestingly, uh, we didn't see any significant response to the cherry bolt alone. So there doesn't seem to be evidence that the that they're locating uh, hosts from uh, cherry in our experiment, cherry alone. But again, this is a very small signal from, the, from a cherry bolt. So perhaps they're responding to cherry trees in the field, but we don't, wouldn't see that sort of response uh, using those small bolts of cherry alone. Also, it appears that uh, males and females, we saw a little bit of increase, but they're not, not, not significantly different from the blank control, which suggests that uh, the presence of males inhibits the production of this pheromone from females. So once males are present in the log, females essentially ratchet down the production of this signal. And so we ran this experiment in the field for two weeks and looked at the amount of um, uh, beetles that we captured uh, over each day. And we found a peak in, in our capture rate here at about day eight. So this is evidence that females start to produce pheromone about six days after their initial colonization of the tree. And that pheromone production uh, is maintained for about four or five days and then drops off. So one of the con our conclusions from this experiment are that the um, females, once a female colonizes a tree, um, they produce a volatile pheromone that coordinate, coordinates mating, and then this aggregation pheromone is produced about six days after the initial colonization. So what implications do these results have for management is that these semiochemicals could be useful for um, monitor, detecting, monitoring, and controlling uh, the peach bark beetle. This summer, we, well, last summer, we've, ad we've uh, putatively identified this compound is a compound called benzaldehyde, and we're going to test it at an operational level 
at uh, cherry tree plantations here near campus uh, to, to determine the extent to which we could uh, perhaps uh, uh, lessen the amount of attack on those cherry trees using traps baited uh, with benzaldehyde. So this is a far different um, biology than ambrosia beetles. Bark beetles feed just underneath the bark on the nutrient-rich phloem, whereas ambrosia beetles feed deep into the pith or heartwood of the, uh, and sapwood of the tree. Uh, colonizing beetles essentially drill into the tree, and there uh, they mate um, and, and produce brood. Bark beetles are among the most common insects found at ports of entry in the world. They uh, they're, uh, have an incredible uh, propensity to be invasive. Um, these, they can transport pathogens. Uh, they're difficult to control due to this cryptic life cycle of, of living uh, beneath the tree. Currently, there are 12 species of exotic brosia beetles that have been established in the U.S. And uh, since their arrival, they have detrimental effect on a number of deciduous hardwood trees, um, or deciduous trees, rather. Uh, they, they have a broad host range. Uh, some of them can use um, as many as 200 species of tree because they don't really rely on the tree for, um, for food for their young, but rather they provision them with these uh, pathogenic fungi that they, they carry with them. So one of the most common and aggressive ambrosia beetles um, is, a, is an invasive uh, Zalisandrus crassiosculus. Um, the granulate ambrosia beetle. These are large beetles with respect to other ambrosia beetles. They're about twice the size. Uh, although they are quite small nonetheless, they're only two and a half to uh, uh, two to two and a half millimeters in size for the females and the males are about half of that size. And they have an interesting biology. All members of the xylobarines, um, the tribe of these, of these beetles, are haplodiploid, meaning that unfertilized eggs become males and fertilized eggs become females. Also interesting is that the males are flightless. And so they remain with that host tree there throughout the entirety of their life cycle. And once females are uh, ready to disperse from that host tree, they uh, either can have the choice of uh, mating with their brothers who are in that tree, or um, to uh, disperse, colonize a new tree, and mate with their sons. And then they can uh, search uh, and uh, search for new hosts. So they can have two generations per year in the U.S. Uh, uh, Zylosandrus crassiosculus and Zylosandrus uh, germanus, which are both um, invasive insects, are vectors of um, wood staining fungi, um, the fusarium and ambrosia, ambrosiella fungi, uh, they're an important economic pests due to their broad host range. Um, they're capable of infesting uh, apparently healthy trees. And as I mentioned, they're difficult to control because of their, they're concealed within the sapwood. Uh, the fungi, these pathogenic fungi that they carry in little pits here called mycangia, which are on their um, thorax, um, those fungi girdle the tree and they cause cankers, or these little areas of, of deadening around, around these initial holes. They, again, they bore straight into the sapwood of the tree and they create these galleries. And early signs of infestation are projections from, uh, from the tree, these here, which are referred to as toothpicks. And these toothpick structures are made up of a combination of sawdust and frass that's being pushed out by the colonizing females. And then once inside, they, they, uh, they introduce a pathogenic fungi. And as I mentioned, the, the fungi are detrimental to the tree because they cut off the supply of water and nutrients between uh, the roots and shoots, and they form cankers. They also stain the wood, as you can see some of that staining that's the result of, uh, of, uh, of, of these cankers and uh, it reduces its commercial value. And some trees are, uh, that they attack are of very high commercial value uh, and are preferred host plants of uh, Zalisandrus crassiosculus. One of which is the American chestnut. 
And uh, in 1904, a fungal blight was accidentally introduced to the U.S. It nearly wiped out American chestnut. And Purdue, uh, the HTRC and the American Chestnut Foundation and others are working toward um, breeding uh, 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 blight-resistant hybrids of the American chestnut. These are uh, double back-crossed American and Asian chestnut that um, may have some uh, blight resistance. Um, and what we found is um, the, uh, these trees that are growing here near Purdue are hammered by attacks from Crassiosculus. And these are difficult to control by uh, conventional methods. And um, controlling them by semiochemicals seems to hold promise for controlling um, these beetles. So one way that uh, one of the uh, effective methods for monitoring um, uh, wood-boring beetles is, is through the use of ethanol. Um, ethanol is a general attractant. And it's immediately used to monitor um, the flight activity of these beetles and also to time insecticide applications. Ethanol has also been found to synergize the activity of other semiochemical lures, like pheromone lures. And um, ethanol is a general attractant for Xylosandrus beetles, um, and including uh, Xylosandrus germanus. In addition to ethanol, there are other semiochemicals that can be used to control ambrosia beetles. For example, canophthorin is a bark volatile that's associated with deciduous trees um, that is used as a repellent for uh, bark beetles that feed on conifers because those beetles then sense this compound as being a hardwood tree and, and, and are repelled by it. And there's some evidence that it acts as an attractant to Xylosandrus germanus um, and verbenone is another compound that's an anti-aggregation pheromone component of bark beetles that feed on conifers. Um, and there's some evidence that it might act as a repellent for some of these ambrosia beetles that attack hardwoods. But the response of this of uh, Xylosandrus crassiosculus to these two compounds hadn't been empirically tested. So uh, in my lab, we undertook a research effort to test the, the extent to which verbenone would act as a repellent and canophthorin would act as an attractant to um, uh, Xylosandrus crassiosculus. And also, we tested whether uh, the extent to which ethanol will synergize the activity of, of canophthorin uh, as an attractant for this beetle. As I mentioned earlier, uh, ethanol is often uh, a synergist or uh, increases the, att the attractivity or attraction of beetles to these lures of these semi other semiochemical lures. So we set up a field experiment. Um, it was we targeted one flight period in the summer of 2011, and another flight period in 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 two thousand two flight periods rather in 2012. And this was done uh, nearby Purdue at the Martell Forest and also at the Purdue Wildlife Area, which are both in Tippecanoe County. And the Black Rock Nature Preserve, which is owned by the Niches Land Trust here uh, near campus. And we set up uh, transects of these pop bottle traps. And so these traps are constructed uh, are comprised of a pop bottle on top, a two liter uh, pop bottle that's been coated with uh, fluon, a non sick substance um, that's applied to the inside of that top bottle to prevent captured insects from escaping. And then the collection bottle, which is a one liter bottle, was filled with a concentration of salt, salt solution. Um, we, we, knew, we, we first set out ethanol baited uh, Lindgren funnel traps as monitoring traps in the field. And that allowed us to determine uh, when the beetles were flying and when they weren't. And this would let us, uh, informed us as to when to start this experiment of these uh, five traps along transects. There were, we set up three of these transects per site. We checked the traps twice a week, and after the insects were collected, uh, the traps were rotated down their position here and these, uh, along these transects to uh, control for any location effects there might be from the placement of these traps. So throughout the course of the experiment, each of these traps occupied each position in the transect. 
All those collected beetles were then placed in ethanol and then, until they could be identified in the lab later. Uh, traps were baited with uh, individual lures consisting of either uh, an ethanol rate of um, a release rate of ethanol. This should be 100 micrograms per day, not uh, I mean milligrams per day, not micrograms. Um, a verbeno with a release rate of about 50 milligrams per day. Canothrin had a lower release rate, and then we tested the combination of canothrin and ethanol. These were put, um, some of these uh, lures came in, um, in little uh, emitters like these seen here. The ethanol lures we put into little pl plastic baggies. And these release rates are um, bio-rational in some regards. They uh, uh, approximate those, resp those um, rates that the beetles responded to in our preliminary studies. And what we found with this, uh, in this study with regard to Crassiosulis, this figure shows the mean number of beetles trapped per day, uh, per, per collection period on the y-axis, and along the x-axis is the treatment. So the combination of canothrin and ethanol, traps baited with, com with the combination of canothrin and ethanol, uh, captured significantly more beetles than all other treatments suggesting that there is an additive effect, uh, maybe even a synergistic effect, when these two compounds are presented together. What's also interesting is that uh, canophthorin alone doesn't appear to act as a general attractant uh, when compared to the ethanol and to the blank, into the blank traps, the control traps which means that using these lures alone may not be a very effective method for monitoring and control, but when the lures are combined, they, 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 you can increase the efficacy of these traps. What's also interesting is we saw a significant decrease in the trap capture um, uh, with using verbenone, suggesting that it acts as a repellent for these beetles, and the combination of canophthrin and ethanol is an effective attractant. With regard to Xylosandrus uh, germanus, traps baited with, canoff, with the combination of canothrin and um, ethanol, here we captured more beetles than all treatments alone, but not uh, all of the, uh, than canothrin alone, and also uh, the blank, and we saw a slight increase in uh, the trap capture when these two compounds um, were used together uh, when compared to ethanol alone. What's interesting here is that it, um, the, uh, it appears that uh, there was not as much, there wasn't a significant attraction to canophthrin, um, but there was also a significant decrease in the number of beetles that were caught using uh, verbenone. And um, so verbenone might be an effective uh, repellent for this beetle. We also captured a natural enemy, uh, Medelliana disloca uh, dislocatus, a clarid, a checkered beetle, that responded to the combination of these uh, canothrin and ethanol. And so this suggests that um, that this beetle might be responding, uh, this predator might be responding to these compounds in, in such a fashion that they might signal the presence of prey items. Um, there, was no repellent, there was no repellent effects with verbena, and um, there was an uh, increase in attraction to canophthorin versus the blank, but the combination of them, of the two, were quite effective. We also caught a serambicid beetle. Um, Molorchus bimaculatus in significant numbers that was attracted to verbenone, um, which is a, we're not quite sure what's going on there, but it suggests that verbenone might play a part in its chemical ecology. So in summary, uh, Xylosandrus crassiosculus was attracted to canophthorin with ethanol lure and was repelled by the verbenone lure. So the use of ethanol with canophthorin might be an effective means for monitoring 
uh, this beetle um, and, and control it. So in the future, we plan to use this combination of ethanol and canophthorin. And this summer, we're evaluating this uh, uh, through a, a broad collaboration in six, uh, in six states. Um, and these semiochemicals could then be used to protect high-value plantings, uh, like American chestnut here at Purdue, in a push-pull scenario, where uh, outside of that planting, we could put traps that are baited with the attractant. And inside the planting, um, have traps that are baited with the repellent. And um, this would then essentially push uh, the beetles away from uh, the, the, the planting while simultaneously pulling them outside of the nursery. This push-pull strategy could be effective in other high plantings of uh, high-value trees that are affected by these ambrosia beetles. So, as I mentioned, the detection and control of many wood borers is difficult um, as the larvae live within the host and the adults are often difficult to locate. And these semiochemicals may play an important role in establishing effective management programs for these beetles. And this information could be useful in optimizing survey strategies for these invasive ambrosia beetles uh, to develop agricultural techniques to bolster their resistance and also um, for enhanced detection of the of invasive species. So in some pheromones or semiochemicals are important. Now if you'd like to get more information about my research, um, it can be found here at this website uh, www.entm.purdue.edu slash forest. I'd like to acknowledge um, the hard work of graduate students in my lab, Nikki Vanderland, the, the uh, work on um, ambrosia beetles was part of her master's uh, research. Matt Passion, who's doing some of the work with um, the uh, peach bark beetle. Gabriel Hughes and Lindsay Kolich for their help in the field. This work was also supported by a number of hard working undergrads. This is a collaborative work with Arbor America, which is a, uh, a group that is uh, planting uh, black walnut and, uh, and uh, black cherry uh, here in Indiana and the Niches Land Trust and funding was provided through the Van Eck, Fred Van Eck Foundation and uh, Department of Forestry and Natural Resources. So this was just a closing shot to see the difference in the, in the biology of these two um, uh, beetles. This is the peach bark beetle, and you can see it's boring just underneath the bark here and here. And this is the ambrosia beetle, again, which bores deep into the tree. And evidence of infestation of, of ambrosia beetles is often these uh, toothpicks that are made from the combination of, of frass and, and fungi. So with that, I'd be happy to take any questions. Thanks.